1952, the United States Supreme Court said that motion pictures are a significant medium for the communication of ideas and are therefore eligible for First Amendment protection. But what about video games? Are they sufficiently communicative or expressive to qualify for First Amendment protection? The answer might seem obvious now, but in the 1980s, several courts said that video games do not qualify for First Amendment protection. The Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, for example, reached this conclusion in a pair of decisions in 1983. In the first of these two decisions, the court reviewed Space Invaders as a representative game. While it acknowledged that the game has a plot or theme, the court said that Space Invaders and other video games are not sufficiently communicative or expressive or informative to qualify for First Amendment protection. In its second decision in 1983, the court reviewed four games that are now classics, Miss Pac-Man, Tron, Donkey Kong, and Zaxxon, and one game that is largely forgotten, Kangaroo. After considering these five games, the Massachusetts court reaffirmed its earlier view that video games are not entitled to First Amendment protection. The court did note, however, that video games might become sufficiently expressive for First Amendment protection in the future. And many years later, starting in 2001, the lower federal courts repeatedly held that video games are eligible for First Amendment protection. Two years ago, in 2011, in Brown v. Entertainment Merchants Association, the U.S. Supreme Court finally addressed this question. The Supreme Court said, quote, like the protected books, plays, and movies that preceded them, video games communicate ideas and even social messages through many familiar literary devices, such as characters, dialogue, plot, and music, and through features distinctive to the medium, such as the player's interaction with the virtual world. That suffices to confer First Amendment protection, end quote. So how should we think about video games as an expressive medium? Should we think about even these older arcade games as expressive, or just the newer ones that look like movies? And what about other types of games, such as board games, including traditional board games, war games, or Euro games? What is it about games in general that makes them an interesting and important medium of communication? These are the questions that we will consider in this episode of Games Are Not Coffee Mugs. Welcome to the first episode of Games Are Not Coffee Mugs. My name is Bill Ford. I'm with the John Marshall Law School in Chicago. This series of webcasts is about taking the gaming medium seriously, raising the very basic question of what sort of medium we are talking about. As a law professor, this question is of interest to me because it intersects with the law in at least two basic ways. The first, addressed in the introduction, is whether games are a medium for expressing ideas and information and therefore deserve First Amendment protection. The second is whether games deserve the same degree of First Amendment protection as more traditional forms of media, such as newspapers, books, television programs, and films. The legal system's answer to the second question has often been no. This answer can be found in cases involving unfair competition and false endorsement, and even more clearly in cases involving the right of publicity. For decades, the accepted rule for the right of publicity was that games are to be treated like posters, t-shirts, and coffee mugs, meaning that if you want to use someone's name or likeness in a game, you would need a license, just as you would need a license to affix that person's name or likeness to a coffee mug. The implication was that games are no more expressive than a celebrity embossed coffee mug. The status of that long-standing rule, however, has been unclear for several years, ever since a 2007 decision of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit involving fantasy baseball. The Eighth Circuit held that fantasy baseball providers don't need a license to use players' names and likenesses, thanks to the First Amendment. But earlier this week, on May 21st, a divided panel of the Third Circuit weighed in on the same issue in a case involving college athletes in video games like this one. It said First Amendment protection and right of publicity cases apply to video games with the same force as to biographies, documentaries, docudramas, and other expressive works depicting real-life figures. But as suggested by the dissenting judge, the majority did not treat games like other forms of media. My take? I think the majority treated games like coffee mugs. Now the question is how the Ninth Circuit will resolve a similar case that is pending before it for over two years. Today's discussion is related to the underlying issue in these types of cases. Specifically, how do we think about games as a medium of expression? At what point did games become worthy of being treated as a medium of expression like newspapers, books, television programs, and films? And how do games compare to these other more traditional forms of media? I'll ask these questions of my guests. First is Doris Frusch, 
an assistant professor at the School of Cinema and Interactive Media at DePaul University. Professor Roosh teaches courses about game design and designs games herself. These games include Acrasia, a game about addiction, Elude, a game about depression, and Zombie Yoga, a game about at least zombies and yoga. Next is Tom Dowd, an associate professor in the School of Media Arts at Columbia College Chicago. Professor Dowd has worked in the game industry since the 1980s. Among his design and developer credits are the Shadowrun role-playing game and numerous games in the Battletech tradition, including Battletech itself, Mech Assault, Mech Warrior 2, and Mech Warrior 3. And finally, Eugene Jarvis, the co-founder of Raw Thrills Incorporated. He has worked in the game industry since the 1970s, starting with Atari and later Williams and Midway. His design credits include Defender, Robotron 2084, NARC, Smash TV, and the Cruise and Driving Games. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, let me start with you, Tom. Sure. So in one of the early cases from 1982, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts was thinking about space invaders and whether or not, based on the example of space invaders, video games should be protected by the First Amendment. And here's what the court said. The plaintiff has failed to demonstrate that video games import sufficient communicative, expressive, or informative elements to constitute expression protected under the First Amendment. It appears that any communication or expression of ideas that occurs during the playing of a video game is purely inconsequential. The plaintiff has succeeded in establishing only that video games are more technologically advanced games than pinball or chess. That technological advancement alone, however, does not impart First Amendment status to what is otherwise an unprotected game. So you worked on uh, board games, non-electronic uh, games like Battletech early on in your career. And I think as we uh, th think about the board game medium, we start with a game like Othello, which has no theme, no backstory, no art. It's not anything more than gameplay. Mm -hmm. From that, we could advance to chess, the example used by the court. Uh, although still fairly abstract, there's at least a theme there. It's two kingdoms battling it out. As we advance beyond that to games like Battletech, we start to get more of a backstory, mm -hmm. more art. If you had the mech warrior role-playing mm -hmm. components, you get a lot more than that. Um, but what's your take on the court's uh, treatment of, of board games? Uh, at what point do you think board games acquire enough of an expressive element that we could say this is actually part of a medium of expression? Well, I think it has to do entirely with what the creators are trying to accomplish with the game itself, um, because uh, uh, you obviously you can have you can have board games that are um, uh, simulations of a form, recreations of historical events, or with the BattleTech stuff, we were being very very speculative, okay, and to a large extent we were uh, attempting to appeal to a lot of the crowd that played traditional war games, but was also were also science fiction fans, mm -hmm. so we created this elaborate, overly elaborate, some would say. Uh, fictional universe that justified all of this warfare and then created a story that wrapped around it to explain why all of these conflicts were occurring. And the, in, our intention was to create something of a neutral environment for that storytelling so that the participants could decide who they liked, who they didn't like, who they favored, um, and could create rivalries amongst the players and use the story to, to kind of promote that. Um, and some of those stories could be somewhat controversial, some of them could be uh, somewhat inconsequential. Um, so we were trying to push buttons mm -hmm. in the players to, to come up with these ideas to explain why they were then gonna sit down at the table for three hours and move little plastic figures around and roll dice and, and do all the goofy stuff associated with games. And I think that as game creators decided that they could tell those kinds of stories through the mechanics, through the situations that the, uh, the, of the games that they were creating, these kind of expression possibilities started to, to arise. Are you at least sympathetic to the court's worry that chess may fall short? It, it seems uh, that Battletech is clearly on the other side right. of the line. Where would you put chess? There, I mean, you have to start. You have to start looking at the definition of expression, mm -hmm. right? I mean, what, when you when you say they're a medium of expression, what do you mean by that? Right. Do, well, um, do we see a communication of ideas and information in 
uh, maybe the traditional form of chess. We can imagine an alternative form of mm -hmm. chess where the pieces are changed to the point mm -hmm. where you can go, all right, now it's saying something. But there's, there's been a mm -hmm. lot of philosophy that's been written about chess theory mm -hmm. and the idea of sacrificing pawns mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So you, you, can, you can argue that there is a, 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 an emergent expression that's come from it. Did, you know, whoever back whenever who created chess sit there and think, you know, oh, we're going to make a comment about the, the um, you know, leader's abilities to sacrifice lesser pieces. They probably didn't, but that came out of an understanding of what chess was really doing. Um, so is there, is there, it, it, there's certainly interpretation. Is there expression? That's hard to say. Eugene, let me turn to you. Okay. Uh, the Massachusetts High Court didn't seem to have a very favorable view of pinball as a medium of expression either. What's your take as someone who was working on pinball in the early or the mid '70s? What's your take on pinball as a medium of expression? Well, I think you know there's two ways you can look at pinball. One, one you can look at it as just a basic mechanical game where you have flippers and bumpers and and you're batting around balls in a kind of a mechanical, I uh, think kind of like baseball electromechanical baseball almost. Um, but, you know, pinball games over the years, and that's me, they kind of started that way, but they've get, they have themes, they have um, rules of the game, there's, you know, an interaction with the player in the game. And uh, what's interesting is like, it's almost, in my mind, if, if something is being banned or censored, it must be <laughs> by um, logical conclusion there must be a medium of expression it's there because, something. because you have to yeah. ban it and censor it. And, and pinball was banned and censored for many, many years. Although I think the rationale <laughs> there was that it might involve gambling. And theming a slot machine is not likely to protect the slot machine maker from a claim that they're involved in illegal gambling. Uh, but as you said, pinball, uh, well, I think it goes beyond theming, right? Eventually, we get pinball games that start to use the game mechanics to tell a story, right? right exactly. And, and you mentioned uh, earlier we talked about High Speed, yeah. which is a game about essentially a, a, the player is the driver breaking the law, running the red lights, uh, trying to get away from the cops. And so in a very basic uh, cops and robbers sort of theme. So, I mean... And yes, the narrative in that game yeah. uh, progresses through the gameplay, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And as you you know, manipulate the ball and hit certain goals and you are advancing and finally you get to run the red light and, <laughs> and, and, the, and the sirens go off and the, uh, the cop comes on the walkie-talkie. So, you know, it's, it's a very rich uh, interactive experience. I really think uh, both pinball, which is, you know, probably a little more basic than video, but they're both approaching uh, like interactive movie type experiences. Pinball maybe is more, uh, more theatrical. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. I, I think they are mediums of expression, and they certainly, certainly in their mature form today, you could, I think you could successfully argue that. Well, now that case was actually about video games, and so let's talk about video games right. for a moment. So at what point did video games become deserving of First Amendment protection? The earliest games like Pong uh, seemed to fall short of communicating yeah. ideas and right. information. Pong didn't even have a theme. Uh, maybe Breakout had a very weak theme, but it's still a bouncing ball sort of game. Uh, so at what point do you think games advanced beyond that? At the time the Massachusetts court was considering these issues, it was 1982, so we already had games like Space Invaders, which right. it con considered in one of the cases. It also considered uh, Miss Pac-Man, Tron, Donkey Kong, Zaxxon, and Kangaroo. Uh, there's no indication they played Defender of Robotron, but <laughs> right. at what point do you think video games matured to a point where we could say, now it's a medium that communicates ideas and information? Um, you know, I, 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 Pong is maybe a simulation of the game of tennis or mm -hmm. hockey, um, and uh, very basic. Um, I would say in the, in the late 70s with the introduction of the microprocessor, which was a miniature computer, right. this, and this was a development several years after Pong, all of a sudden then you could um, create a, a very expressive and, and complex uh, interactive experience. And, and again, and, uh, your point of gambling was well taken with pinball, but video games at that point were not gambling related, and they were banned in many, mm -hmm. many localities. And they must have been expressive mediums. They weren't gambling. There was some reason people were censoring and they thought they were violent. They were, you know, going on to Mortal Kombat, obviously. Um, they were obviously expressing ideas that people didn't like. 
So uh, I, I think you really could argue post Space Invaders that certainly uh, games were a very expressive medium. Well, the earliest game that seemed to generate any controversy about violence was Death Race. Right. Uh, that would have been 1976, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that may be an example of what you're talking about, where the game did seem to communicate ideas that people found disturbing. Exactly. Little stick yeah. figures run over yeah. by very simple vehicles. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it was, it's, it's kind of an argument that um, uh, opponents of, of video games have made for many, many years is it's an interactive medium. They felt that it's different than, like movies, you watch someone kill someone, it's the, the feeling as well, maybe that's not so bad, maybe people are just used to it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a generational thing, but in a video game, you actually go and kill someone or something, and certainly all the great video games, many, many of them are very violent, including, say, Pac-Man, mm -hmm. which is a game that we all accept as, oh, that's just a little kid's game and everything, but you really look at the game, it's, you're, you're, you're cannibalizing your, your opponents. You're eating them. Well, you know, well, I mean. <laughs> well, Dig Dug is horrifying, right? I mean, Dig Dug, you jam the air pump into the, yeah. the cute little yeah. creature and <laughs> pump it up till yeah. it explodes, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. I don't think yeah. I realized how gory that was until many, many years yeah. mm -hmm. uh, after playing it. Yeah. Uh, so it didn't quite register as mm -hmm. gory uh, at yeah. the time mm -hmm. that I played it. Doris, let me bring you in on this. Um, what's your take on the earliest video games in the genre of of games like Space Invaders, uh, Pac-Man, and games of that area. Do you see those games as communicating ideas and information, or do you, uh, do you think you need to look further on in time? Yeah, I think these questions are confusing because they start with this old-fashioned and biased idea that expression and communication relates to the fiction of something, that a story is being told. This is how we were raised. We have a very traditional understanding of what narrative is, that it's linear, it has characters, it demonstrates a recognizable environment in some way or another. And games fundamentally are systems. So this is going, this is not taking into account what the nature of games really are as games and not a storytelling medium. So if games are system, they inherently have ideas, values in their structures. I would say even chess has values in their structures. Pong? Pong has the value that if you don't hit the ball, you lose. And so it creates a hierarchy between players where there are winners and there are losers. You could have added a mechanic in which um, the one who is least skillful wins for being the least skillful that would really shift our perception of what accomplishment means in our culture. So there is a value there. And I think these discussions about um, a game starts becoming a medium of expression when it becomes closer to traditional media just doesn't do justice to what games do best, which is simulate systems, create relationships between elements, and take into account how things operate when they're set in motion and create a dynamic. You cannot make a game without somehow inscribing values into the system. Simply, simply the idea that there needs to be a goal is already a value. Uh, yeah, although I, I guess I somewhat sympathize with the courts looking for something attached to the system that is clearly communicative. And um, I, I think that many games achieve that. With a simple game like Pong, though, uh, even though the game of Pong, maybe like any activity, has these embedded values that go into constructing it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to see how you might think of Pong as communicating much to the player beyond the simple message of somebody's going to win and, and, and somebody's going to lose. Right, but that's not a problem of the medium. That's a problem mm. of this particularly mm. portrayed content. Mm. If somebody only watched porn movies, they would mm. think films are a very poor form of expression. Mm because all you see is mm -hmm. that kind of material, right? Mm -hmm. So it's confusing the message with the messenger, and the messenger has always had the potential to express ideas. Has it been used or not? Over the ages, certainly board games did it a long time ago. Um, and video games can do too, and it's not just a technical thing, but as you mentioned right. before, intentionality. Right. Do you want to express it? And right. then you use the means at your disposal, and games can totally do that. Right, and we can imagine any medium in a particular instance 
falling short of communicating something. I mean, you can have the television mm -hmm. turned on and just the, uh, the, the various colors that show that the station's off the air. I'm not sure that that's communicating anything. So that, that might be an example of, of television as a medium in a particular instance not communicating. Pong may be that sort of example or analogous to that sort of example, but I, I completely agree that um, Pong is not the medium, and there's, there's a lot more to the medium even before uh, games like Pong um, that demonstrate that there's a lot of interest going on. Mm -hmm. in the and I was, I was about to say, I think there's also a little bit of how deep do you have to look to find it, mm -hmm. right? Is it is it something that is being directly and overtly presented, or do you have to do some degree of deconstruction, some degree of analysis, <laughs> some degree of, you know, of 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 work to get at it, or is it just something that's it's just being kind of thrown down the road? But I remember when I was younger, walking into an arcade and seeing Missile Command, mm -hmm. and starting to play Missile Command and being kind of almost a little bit disturbed by the, the, the whole idea of the incoming missiles, and I can't stop them. Mm -hmm. This is something that can't be done. Right, that's well, actually, that's a very know, interesting game because you could argue, well, that's just strictly a mechanical, right. you know, targets hitting things and everything, mm -hmm. but obviously there's a, a message, a big message there. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, I think the fact that, that certainly interactive electronic games are a new medium, people, you know, do not, aren't experienced with it now, we've had 30 years, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you look at you know television or movies, which is a very accepted medium. I mean, you look at, there's a spectrum of material. Sure. You know, from you know, a documentary about penguins or you know, physics or something to a political uh, discussion, you know. And so you have a, you know, to completely, you know, gossip shows and things that people would mm -hmm. say, well, this is just garbage, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pornography. You know, you have this whole spectrum of things. Certain branches of that tree, people would argue, well, that's that's not creative, that's not expressive, that's just, you know, it's somebody, mm -hmm. you know, cooking a steak. I mean, what's so interesting about that? Inconsequential. You know? What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, top chef yeah. of a guy cooking a steak. Who cares? You know, it's right. like, that's not, there's no value there. Um, but uh, I, I think it's, it becomes a matter of opinion. I think Doris is very correct in that the essential element of a game, you know, is an expressive medium inherently. Mm -hmm. You know, just just mm -hmm. as, a, yeah, as, a, as a movie. You're having you, you're having to make value judgments just by yeah. creating the most fundamental Absolutely. of the systems. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing is you know. a given. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean, even if you want to go into into game design a little deeper, when you start making decisions about how difficult some things mm -hmm. are. Uh, for the player to achieve, you're making very concrete decisions about how hard certain things may be in the world or how likely they are to be achieved or should they be rewarded, should yeah. they not be exactly. rewarded. What do you allow, what you don't right. allow? Right. Homosexual right. marriage in The Sims, that's a value statement. It's very expressive. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And you get Sim City, which, you know, there's a certain uh, philosophy of urban governance right. Absolutely. that is inherent in that game yeah. that you know if you are if you want to run a rust belt uh, mm -hmm. you know coal coal burning city you're gonna have some problems right. trying, trying to <laughs> right. trying to advance you know mm -hmm. uh, but it's the, it, with the inherent in the rules of that system yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is mm -hmm. is a message you know, yeah. built in yeah okay well let's turn to some comparisons between games and other forms of media so the question here isn't whether games deserve First Amendment protection, but whether or not games should be treated like other forms of media. Right. So as an example here, I have uh, the leading treatise on the rights of publicity and privacy. This is the 2009 edition. The particular passage that I want to mention here has actually been removed from the current edition. Uh, presumably it's going to be updated at some point. But uh, this is um, uh, J. Thomas McCarthy's comments on the right of publicity cases involving games. He says he feels that the cases involving the unpermitted use of the identities of non-political celebrities are correctly decided. The commentators who criticize the cases often do so by pointing to board games and posters which relate directly to the political process. For example, a game that deals with potential presidential candidates or a traditional political poster designed to be displayed in a public place or in a window. I would immunize from liability the unpermitted use of the names of political figures because of the higher constitutional protection given to political speech. As to non-political celebrities, board games and wall posters featuring these celebrities are not traditional media in which ideas are conveyed and should usually be viewed as more exploitive than informational or educational. Most such uses should be held to be infringements. Now, the sort of uh, 
case that he was talking about that he agrees with uh, would be one of the early cases involving the right of publicity in games. And so one example is the 1973 case from New York involving the Howard Hughes board game. So the Howard Hughes game was a board game that it did include biographical information about Howard Hughes. It was in the booklet, it was on the cards that you would use when you played the game. But uh, a lawsuit resulted because there was no license to use Hughes in the game, and here's what the court said. The court said this, in reality, defendants are not disseminating news. They are not educating the public as to the achievements of Howard Hughes. They are selling a commodity, a commercial product, an entertaining game of chance, the outcome of which is determined by maneuvering tokens on a game board by the throw of the dice. The use of plaintiff's name, biographical data, et cetera, in this context is not legitimate to the public interest. It is merely the medium used to market a commodity familiar to us all in its varied types and forms. So in this form, you get full First Amendment protection. Add a game, add game elements, and the level of First Amendment protection implicitly goes down. Uh, so this is a case from 1973, and, and based on what we've said so far, uh, I think the answer is probably fairly clear to this, but uh, given that a lot of maturity happened in the gaming medium, including board games, in the 70s, mm -hmm. are you at all sympathetic to a court questioning the educational or informative value of a game, at least at that time? Sure. Everybody needs to edu be educated at some point. Well, but the <laughs> court said not through a game, though. No, no, I mean, <laughs> I meant the court needs to be mm. educated. Mm. Okay. <laughs> at some point about the values of the medium. Okay. <laughs> I think if you only look at that board game, then maybe it might not be striking that it serves a deeper purpose or something, but do they make these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis in regard to film and TV as well? So what is baffling to me is the lack of imagination that there could be a board game that actually uses it in a different, uses mechanics and biographical data in a different kind of way that would be worthy of First Amendment protection. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Well, I think some of the difficulty in, case, in situations like this is that the court is being asked to make a judgment based on a very particular instance that ends up being a broad statement, right? So they're looking at the, the Howard Hughes game as an example mm -hmm. of games and saying basically, well, if this is the entire universe of games, then hell no, <laughs> <laughs> right? But Well, and the court might view it as fairly close to the entire universe of right. games because it's a less familiar medium than TVs right. and movies and films. So you would never think that this one movie before you represents you know, a substantial part of this particular form of expression. Mm -hmm. But with a game, mm -hmm. a lack of familiarity with it right. might cause a court to think, you know, this is about all there is, this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and there's not much beyond this particular example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and we don't know what was, I mean, you may probably, you may know better than I, but what was fully argued in the court about games and game context and all of that. So you may have had the, the, the judge or the, whatever, uh, presiding body, you know, looking at their own experience of, you know, Candyland and the game of life and, you know, all those kinds of games and then going, well, yeah, no, this ain't happening. Well, I actually you get know. the impression in this treatise uh, that that was the mindset because there is actually a reference to children's games. And there is actually a reference to how children's games can communicate ideas. Shoots and Ladders actually communicates moral values, right? It tells right. you if you do good, you go up. If you do bad, you go down. Right. And the goal is to go up. So there is a lesson there. But right. my and, and I had kind of just kind of casually thrown out the game of life, but that's actually got very significant mm -hmm. value statements yeah. about success sure. and prosperity and yeah. all of that yeah. that are, you know, are, are, are just, you know, they're saying this is, this is life and yeah. this is how you play it. And if you don't play it this way, yeah. you will lose. Yeah. Well, it, it, is, it is interesting how, you know, for some reason, you know, movies, books, periodicals, they get a pass. Like, you know, this, you know, no matter what piece of garbage is on the table, that's a First Amendment, you know, hands off. But it's, it's weird how games, they cherry pick, and they find some, the crappiest example of a game and go, okay, this is, this is obviously not worthy of anything, you know. But really, I, you know, to Doris's point, if any game is uh, worthy of protection, then all games should be worth it. it it's, it's a medium that has expressive ability. So really, I think the court, court is being very immature at this stage. But they're looking at an immature medium in some regards. Because, 
I mean, if you looked, at, you know, look at movies. I mean, if you looked at the original expressions of, of movies, you know, and you looked sure. at, at any, any of Moybridge's original examples of the running horses or the early stuff of, look, you know, he, we pointed a camera at a train and we showed it to people. You know, no, that that's that's all that is. You right. know, but time went on. People realized that they could use this motion picture technology as a means of expression, and then began to put expression into it, whether it was narrative or abstract or or what have you, and so the perception of the, the medium evolved. Yeah. Everybody's used to that at this point. In the 70s, what did you have as, as your game examples? You know, right. fairly. But it's also more accessible. Movies and, and TV and whatnot, everything that's linear and traditional, mm -hmm. is more accessible because you just need to sit there and watch. A game needs a different kind of commitment to it. You need to play right. it and you need to think about it. And to go to that extent of commitment is often beyond that kind of decision making already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and, and I think also because of the, the uh, relation of games to children. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, right. having, and having mature people actually playing games is, is a fairly new phenomenon. <laughs> sure. You know, and so it was just, it was seen as a children's mm -hmm. media, mm -hmm. not, uh, not a mature expressive mm -hmm. uh, thing. Right, and now you mentioned cherry picking. I actually think it's more likely to be just a lack of awareness for the reasons you just gave. Um, you know, in the 50s, Avalon Hill started mm -hmm. producing games with the intent to market games towards adults. Now, I think it took a while for that to catch on. Their early, early consumers were likely teenagers, uh, but over time, those teenagers get older and they continue to play those games. And so Avalon Hill eventually had some success in marketing more to an adult audience. 3M mm -hmm. started making games that were meant to be marketed towards adults in the mm -hmm. 60s. But my hunch is this that when courts are thinking of the medium, or when commentators are thinking mm -hmm. of the medium, it's basically this, <laughs> Monopoly, right. in its hundreds of forms, over and over. So mm -hmm. I've got Nintendo Monopoly here. I've got Muhammad Ali Monopoly here. I have John Wayne Monopoly here. Right. At home, I have Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Monopoly, which mm -hmm. is my son's favorite. I have <laughs> Star Wars Monopoly. Mm -hmm. But if your conception of the medium is simply a few games repeated over and over and over and rethemed over and over and over, I suppose that could explain why right. they're viewed as a coffee mug in some situations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 I don't think the courts are necessarily um, you know, trying to cherry pick bad examples, but I think there's a real problem with the lack of familiarity with mm -hmm. the medium. Mm -hmm. And in the 70s, I can be a little more sympathetic to the court's lack of awareness. Today, I don't think there's as much of an excuse to mm -hmm. not be aware that there are interesting things going on in the medium. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there is a serious problem with the lack of awareness of all types of games? Oh, and I think it extends beyond that. I think it extends to, in, in, in many ways to all forms of technology. I mean, we look at some of the, the ju judicial analysis and looking at, at social media issues. And there are, there's clear discrepancies between uh, judges who are social me social media savvy and understand it themselves, and those who do not in terms of how things are interpreted. Um, and I think, again, generationally, you know, when you, when you start having those 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 you know men and women on the on the on the bench in their robes who had the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, who had the Xbox, who had the whatever, the the thinking is going to be is going to change. You know, and that's that's something that's a going to happen over time, but b it also is going to have to fall to those who are arguing these cases to bring relevant material before the justices that that make these arguments. You know, because I think even in the seventies, you could have made some of these arguments. Did they? The lawyers themselves may not have known enough to make them. You know, but again, times are changing. People are more familiar with it. You know, uh, you know what's the what, what are the current numbers? You know, a majority of, of American households at least have one or more game consoles. Um, that familiarity is increasing dramatically, regularly, and I think interpretation and understanding is going to change with it. Now, you you asked about what may have been argued in the Howard Hughes case. Mm -hmm. I should say I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if the case file from that fairly old case mm -hmm. still exists. If it does, it would be in an archive in New York, right. and, and I'm not sure right. uh, what's in there. There may be another reason that there's some doubt about the board game medium that causes courts or others to think about games differently, 
and you get the impression from some of the things that are said that it's fine if you want to tell that story, it's fine if you want to communicate that information, but do it in book form. Mm -hmm. Do it in newspaper form. It's as if adding game mechanics somehow devalues, undermines, or inhibits the communication of information. So Games are for children. <laughs> uh, or gambling. Or yeah. gambling. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. what are some ways that game mechanics can actually contribute to the expressive quality and allow you to add something to the expressive quality of the game that you might lose if it was in another form? There is this huge movement of educational games mm -hmm. and the understanding that educational games are, or games are so powerful as a tool for learning because if you don't understand how the game works, you cannot win. And right. so gamers go to great lengths to understand the rules and the system and through that understand how things work together to win. And that's something that no book can ensure. You can still read it and you just don't get it. If you played the game to the end, you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so game designers are extremely good at designing a learning curve that everybody can master at some point if they have like a tiny bit of, of um, resilience to do it. And it's leveraged by the educational games market. They make a lot of games that leverage what we learn from game design on how to integrate learning into mechanics of the games and into the rules of the games. Now, it's not just educational games. You published an extensive analysis of Silent Hill 2, and uh, I get the impression from your take on that game that you would agree that the game mechanics did contribute to the expressive power of that game. It's true. The reason why I didn't jump on that right now, <laughs> <laughs> I think Silent Hill 2 Restless Dreams is a fascinating game. I love mm -hmm. it. It's my favorite horror survival game. Um, you play this character, James Sunderland, and is looking for his dead wife in this very abandoned, creepy town, Silent Hill. There is a very rich subtext to Silent Hill, um, but you can get through the end to the end of the game without ever understanding that subtext, which to me means that it's not integrated into the system of right. the game. It's not really communicated through the rules and through the mechanics, but it's really more on the, on the level of fiction, which is why it's not such a great example to show the intrinsic potential mm -hmm. of, of games. What is a good example of a game that's not oriented towards education, where the game mechanics really do a great job of reinforcing? I, I can give you an example, okay. and, it, and it's hotly argued whether it's intentional or not. <laughs> but in the horror, the original Resident Evil had, by some estimation, a horrible camera and character control system, mm -hmm. which made it very, very difficult to get away from the zombies. And some argued that was a game design decision to increase tension and, and drama and all of that as you had to, to fight the environment through the controls to escape successfully. And some people said, no, no, it was just bad game design. The, the, <laughs> the result, however, was that it, it, made the game much, it made the game more engaging, more exciting because you had to, you had to, you had to struggle more. So that's, I mean, that's a kind of historical mm -hmm. example. Um, in a more modern and a little bit more storytelling oriented, there was a game that came out last year, year before, called Heavy Rain, which was very, very cinema driven. Very, very, you're, you're playing an interactive movie. And it has a sequence in it that when I played it, I actually had to stop and put the game on pause and think about it because I'm playing as a guy. I'm just a normal part person. I'm, I'm a father and I have two kids and I'm playing with them in the backyard. And the game presents me with the, with the decision of how do I want to play with the children with the implication that these decisions are going to impact later in the game. So do I, as I'm playing with the one boy, do I let him win when I'm playing with him? If I don't, does that mean I'm a bad father? What's the, mm -hmm. you know, and there, there were kind of, there were game, there were real life and meta game level yeah. questions to it, which I kind of stopped and went, okay, I don't encounter that very often where I actually needed to sit and, and think about, am I gonna have this little kid beat me with a game of fake swordplay, and what's the, what's the ramification, not just, in, there, there is a game ramification, but what's the larger statement? Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, I think they made a, they made a very deliberate uh, connection. Yeah, and I, well, you know, I think, there, I, I think you find this in many, many games, but the, the difficulty is being a, an interactive medium, being a medium where the, uh, a game play, there's so many branches, Right. You could have 10, 20, 40, 100 hours of gameplay. It's hard to distill that 
You know, there's so many different unique experiences that each individual will experience something differently and may completely miss mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. some of those scenes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so it's very hard to distill. Like on a movie, it's like a linear medium. It's like here it is, here's what happened, blah blah blah. A, ba a game, you you play, it, you'll have a different experience. You may say, oh, this game is crap. There's, right. there's the control was horrible. Mm -hmm. You didn't like it. He played the same game and go, oh, what a rich cinema, you know, what a mm -hmm. rich experience. They were, mm -hmm. they were, you mm -hmm. know, deliberately, you know, degraded my control to right. to show to <laughs> make my fear, you know, my pulse increase, and you know, so you you get these different experiences. So it becomes a very different, uh, mm -hmm. a, dif a difficult thing to, um, you know, to distill into a, a, a linear story. And I think people are very good at filling in gaps. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if if they find themselves negatively inclined to some, suddenly all these decisions are terrible, or <laughs> they're they're justifying different things to to support the fact that they yeah. liked it. Yeah. You yeah. know. But you asked about expressiveness of rules and systems, and I've, I finally I have an example. I don't think it matters whether it's an educational game or another game. If it's communicating that through the system, it's fine. But I, I thought of something. Uh, have you heard of Rod Humble's game, The Marriage? No. Have you? No. Yeah. OK, so it is a very abstract game. It works with two squares and circles. The two squares are one is pink, one is blue. I will just tell you what happens, and you're the judge of whether that's expressive. So, <laughs> so there is a blue and a pink square. They need to kiss at times, so they, their edges need to touch. And the blue square will then shrink and drift off, and the pink square will grow. And they have to both stay within the same space and be approximately the same size over time for the marriage to proceed to the next level. There are sev seven different levels. And there are circles coming into the game space. And if the pink square touches a circle, it grows a little bit, but it doesn't do much. If the blue square touches a circle, it's fantastic. It grows in size. So the blue square has a tendency of going off and touching circles and growing and flourishing. And the pink square has a tendency of wanting to kiss all the time and staying close to the blue square. So there are more rules to that. Mm -hmm. but. The message of this, this is, Rod Humble said, this is modeling his experience of what marriage is like, his personal experience. Uh -huh. The rules are very clear. I mean, they're, both partners have different needs. The woman wants to stay home and kiss, and the man wants to go out and be social and have activities. There are a hell of a lot of value judgments in there. It's very mm -hmm. expressive, and it's mm -hmm. communicating through the system, the rules, and the mechanics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly feminists would have uh, <laughs> uh, an opinion just, of that one. Just a bit. Um, <laughs> But if you like, I, give you, I can give you okay. another example. Um, uh, Brenda Romero, formerly Braithwaite, oh. created a game called Train. Right. And it's a very simple game about, um, uh, the, and the, the core mechanic is getting as many people into the train cars as you can and moving them down the track in the most efficient way possible. And it's very straightforward. And it's just, it's kind of about spatial management and this, and you just kind of progress along. And as you progress along, it gets revealed each, the name of each train station as you're getting to it. And if you're a student of history, you may catch on a little bit, but if, even if you're not, by the time you get to the last station and it's revealed to be Auschwitz, you realize that you've been playing a final solution simulation. Mm -hmm. And all of the efficiencies and all of the, 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 the energy that you've been putting into succeeding in the game has been all about bringing these people to their death. Mm -hmm. And you didn't question the rules, that's the important right. part. There are holes in the rules where you could, if you thought creatively, you could derail the train and the people would never reach their mm -hmm. final stop. And so by not trying to understand what you're actually doing and blindly following rules, which is the criticism to the Third mm -hmm. Reich, mm -hmm. uh, is exactly that if you don't do that, you are mm -hmm. also guilty. You have the potential for that sort of guilt and that's mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. And if anyone who's, who watches has the opportunity to do it, a little reading on some of this, the reaction of the players mm -hmm. when it's revealed what the game is actually about is, is really interesting and notable because the, the, the range of reaction is, is pretty amazing. Well, Train is actually a good segue to the final question I wanted to ask, which is whether or not the game medium uh, has some serious limitations that maybe other ones don't. 
Uh, and so a good example, I think, is this one, King Philip's War, a war game about King Philip's War published mm -hmm. by Multiman Publishing in 2010. This particular game attempts to simulate uh, a war that took place in uh, uh, the New England area of this country, well, uh, before it was uh, mm -hmm. the United States of America, uh, from 1675 to 1676. And this game actually generated some controversy. Mm -hmm. Now, one line of the controversy was that there were some problems with the history. Now, insofar as that was the criticism, that's the sort of criticism that might be made of a book or a movie. You've done a bad job with history. But another one of the criticisms was very different. That was, this topic shouldn't be in a game. It trivializes the topic, uh, you know, this particular war, like you know, any war, uh, involved a lot of tragedy uh, and a lot of ugliness. And so the criticism was that there's a problem with making a game out of it. So the question that I want to pose is whether or not there are some limitations on the medium associated with dealing with certain topics. Now, Train is somewhat unusual uh, because it wasn't a commercial game. Right. It's um, only meant to be played once, and, and we might think of it as a form of uh, maybe performance art. Sure. Uh, but if, if we were talking about a commercial game, are there topics that don't, work? Is the medium more limited than books and TV, or is it all about how you handle the topic, which would be the same as mm -hmm. it would be for books and television? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. It's <laughs> If you watch Schindler's List, that's a commercial movie, right? right? And it was a blockbuster, and it made millions, and it deals with an extremely sensitive topic mm -hmm. in a specific, very commercial and uh, appealing way, actually. Mm -hmm. Why should games be off limit? Mm -hmm. Just because we have in our minds that it's only kids play, that's outrageous. Mm -hmm. It's a medium that demands to be taken seriously, that needs to be taken seriously. And it's more perception in people's heads that games cannot do that, but it has nothing to do with the medium itself. Right. Before Arch Spiegelman's Mouse, nobody thought comics could touch a serious topic, right. and they can. Right, and I think there just has to be a, an understanding that sometimes it's gonna do it badly. And that doesn't mean, yeah. that's not a condemnation of the entire medium. That just means that this particular expression, if you will. But this person who made it didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> or they were trying to do something that is so against what everybody else, you know, is thinking. But they can do that. And then there are whatever consequences come from that. But they can't be stopped from doing that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think... Um... I mean, part of the problem, I think, with games, people have with games, it's it's almost the medium is too powerful. <laughs> you know, it's 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 so immersive and so personal. Like in the train game, mm -hmm. I mean, you are taking people to their deaths. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's not you're not seeing a movie about someone else doing this. You're not, you know, you are doing it. You are, you know, Mortal Kombat. You are pulling someone's skull and pulling their spinal cord out. You know, it's you. You know, and I think it's it's so personal because of the interactive nature of it, you are a protagonist in mm -hmm. it, um, that it becomes very, very powerful. And I think this is what really upsets people, is that uh, it, the medium is almost too powerful. Well, as a, one note on this game, the controversy actually erupted when it was still in its prototype stages. So uh, some of the historical problems may have been ironed out. You mm -hmm. still have the question, though, of whether right. or not it was appropriate for a game. And it, as a practical matter, there do seem to be very few topics that don't end up in game form, whether it's a conflict, whether it's a pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's a nuclear war. All of these topics do mm -hmm. show up in game form. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, as you suggest, may just be a question of how you handle it. But there still is this perception on the part of some people, I think, that because this is you know, a children's medium, uh, right. because it's probably somewhat silly, that you but should it's not, not even true anymore. It's no. not a children's medium. The average gamer is between 20 mm -hmm. and 35. Right. Right. And I mean, <laughs> and with video games specifically, <clears throat> for such a long time, video games did certain things because that's what they did well, right? What we call the verbs and the things that you can do. You could run, you could jump, you could shoot. All of that stuff video games could do very well, so that's what they focused on. And now, over the last five, six years, you've been seeing a change mm -hmm. In, in games because the technology has changed, but also because the people who are making games are part of a game generation that have grown up with them and they're using these games to make 
to, to express themselves in ways that people who write short stories or would, uh, would, would paint uh, portraits or whatever are using. Um, so again, it, it's kind of going back to the, once the judges are used to having games around, right? Now we're seeing people who have grown up having games around and they're using them as their expression. And so the, me the medium is maturing. Okay, well, that's all the time we have. I do want to thank my guests, Eugene Jarvis, Tom Dowd, Doris Roosh, and I also want to offer a special thanks to Doc Mack of the Galloping Ghost Arcade, who was good enough to let us film the introduction at that uh, very impressive location. If you have not been there, you do need to go. Thank you very much.